All right, well, we are at two o'clock, so um, we always seem to run out of time, um, so I want to get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and Happy New Year. Um, apparently, uh, my voice is not cooperating today again. I did wake up with a case of laryngitis, um, but I appreciate you bearing with me, um, bearing with my voice um, today. I hopefully will only be short, uh, talking for a short amount of time. Um, but I hope you all had a great holiday. Um, we plan to have our Q&A session at the end of the webinar, but um, as always, you can put your questions in the chat at any time. Um, if everyone could just mute your lines to avoid any distractions, that would be great. Um, today, we are super grateful to have our speaker, um, Dr. Stacy Westerman, speak about acute MI and arrhythmias um, as part of our cardiac series. So this is our lecture four, um, so excited for that. And um, just have a few updates um, today, nothing too big. Um, so our next maternal webinar, the plan is for February 7th, um, and the topic, a tentative topic is aorta pathies. Um, and we have Dr. Krishna um, as the speaker. Um, and then I just wanted to remind everybody on the call because I have had some emails out regarding data submission for hypertension um, and wondering how to get access. And every um, person that has um, was is listed as a data contact for our hypertension teams should have received an email with the instructions um, from our uh, maternal and child health epidemiologist, Victoria Sannon. Um, so please look out for her email with the instructions and that'll tell you exactly how to access the GAPQC dashboard um, as well as submit your Q3 hypertension um, data submission. And this um, is actually going to be the way you submit your cardiac data, which will be due of quarter one 2023 as well. Um, so please look out for that email and reach out to me um, if you still have any uh, questions with access. Um, so last month, I did let everybody know that we have updated our website. Um, so we have the lecture recordings and the presentations listed there. Um, and so after today's webinar, that's where those will be. We'll also host them on Microsoft Teams for everybody who has access, but wanted to make sure that everybody had this um, to access it, even if you were not part of the GAPQC um, uh, initiative teams. So those are be available for, for anybody who's interested. And um, here's our GAPQC Cardiac Initiative Driver Diagram. It's a lot, we know, um, but today's lecture, we always kind of want to bring the lectures back to, you know, this specific initiative. Um, and we're really going to pay close attention to the readiness, recognition, and the response key drivers um, and their subsequent interventions. Um, and including, I just wanted to tease these out, establishing a protocol for rapid identification of potential pregnancy-related cardiac conditions, in all practice settings to which pregnant and postpartum people may present. Um, also assessment of escalating warning signs for imminent cardiac event are present and utilizing standardized cardiac risk assessment tools to identify and stratify risk and conducting a risk appropriate workup and implementing the initial management plan. And then lastly, having facility wide standard protocols with checklists and escalation policies for management of people with known or suspected cardiac conditions. So um, just wanted to make sure that we all are kind of eye on the prize with these key interventions that Dr. Westerman is gonna be kind of talking, talking us through today. So I will hand it over to Dr. Krishna for our introduction to Dr. Westerman. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, can you hear me? Just wanna make sure, okay, great. Um, Dr. Westerman was raised in Atlanta, Georgia. She completed her undergraduate degree at Columbia University in New York, followed by her medical and public health degrees at Emory University. Um, she completed her internal medicine residency in Seattle. Um, she returned to Atlanta for her fellowships in cardiovascular disease and car cardiac electrophysiology. Um, her particular interests include cardiac implantable devices, complex ablations, and women's health. She lives in Atlanta with her husband and her three sons, and she is part of the Arrhythmia Center, which offers advanced treatment for atrial fibrillation and heart arrhythmias. So I'll let you um, take it from there, Dr. Westerman. Okay, thank you. I came back from um, the break and my mouse is like not ready to work yet. It does not move for some reason. Uh, 
faster than a snail's pace, but okay. All right. Um, so uh, thank you very much for having me and for that introduction. I want to um, first, you know, just give all of you credit for what you do um, as a prior pregnant person and having done that a few times, it's such a point of vulnerability and, um, you know, sort of really uncertainty. So I really, I, I thank you for all your work and uh, applaud you for what you do. So today, hopefully I will, I will help. My background is cardiology and uh, cardiac electrophysiology, certainly not OBGYN um, or uh, maternal health, but um, I can talk about it from a cardiac perspective. And I know um, Lisa said we would be doing some Q&A at the end, but I'm, I am fine. I don't have my chat on here, but if you want to pipe in and have a question, then um, I'm, I'm fine with interruptions. Our outline today will talk about maternal morbidity and mortality, sort of overall scope in Georgia specific data. It sounds like you had a lecture already on uh, cardiovascular changes in pregnancy, but that's really critical for understanding acute MI and um, arrhythmia. So we'll review some of the hemodynamic changes of pregnancy and then review specifically acute MI and arrhythmias, causes and management. So I had to do a little bit background reading. Maternal mortality includes the concept of pregnancy associated deaths. Um, which is death of a woman while pregnant or within the year, within one year of the end of a pregnancy. And that can be pregnancy related, uh, which is related to being pregnant or associated, but not related. Um, maternal mortality as defined by the WHO includes pregnancy related deaths during pregnancy or within 42 days of the termination of a pregnancy. Worldwide, there are obviously vast disparities in maternal mortality. Um, this graph shows the number of deaths per 100,000 live births as of 2015, purple being the lowest rates and then dark, uh, I guess magenta being the, um, the highest rates. And the United States ranks uh, not so great in terms of other developed countries. We can see um, Canada and areas of Europe, Australia, where have one to 15 uh, deaths per 100,000 live births, whereas America is in the 15 to 30 range. When we look globally at the causes of death, you can see that, um, and again, my, my mouse is just not going to work, but um, maternal hemorrhage is the largest, really the largest block. For younger patients, maternal hypertensive disorders, and then um, HIV um, plays a small role in these deaths. But really, if we look worldwide, one of the most common causes is, is maternal hemorrhage. Thinking about the US specifically, this is um, data as of 2015, but um, uh, increase in the mort maternal mortality in the US it, as it declines elsewhere in other sort of um, similar countries. So US sitting at 26.4 compared to example, uh, Finland or Denmark, where it's closer to four per 100,000 live births. And this is a trend in the United States over time from 1987 to 2018, where you see this rise in pregnancy related deaths. Some of the thought is that we might be paying more attention or might be uh, sort of taking note of these and that explains the rise. Um, but regardless, there is an increase there that has sort of been stable over the past 10 years. There's a difference in race and, race and ethnicity between maternal mortality where non-Hispanic blacks really bear the brunt of pregnancy related deaths. Um, and we have non-Hispanic whites which are significantly lower. Looking at maternal mortality by state, where orange is the highest maternal mortality and purple is the lowest, well, Georgia's not doing too well. The second highest maternal mortality in the US, 48.4 per 100,000. Uh, this is 2022, second only to um, Louisiana. California is um, remarkably good at less than five or uh, maybe in the five five to 10 range, but you know, Georgia, our stats aren't looking all that great. And then when you think about, and I, I guess this is probably why you have this call to action, but um, these are uh, sort of the impetus of states to look at mortality, maternal mortality review. So Georgia has to review more maternal mortality and looks at determining whether or not it was preventable and that there is a multidisciplinary membership to, um, to the committee structure, but you compare that with California, which has much more extensive reviewing death up to one year after pregnancy, investigating every pregnancy associated death, and then reviewing causes and trends. So the more we look at this, hopefully the better that we'll do and the more awareness that we have. 
the cause of pregnancy related death in the US. So this is again compared to global data where it's much more the most common is um, is maternal hemorrhage. We have other cardiovascular conditions, cardiomyopathy and hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, which are all really cardiac related. So this is a majority of deaths in the US are um, or close to a majority are related to cardiovascular disease. And um, the, you know, one of the reasons why pregnancy is such a stress from a cardiovascular standpoint is there are such really dramatic changes in our cardiovascular hemodynamics during pregnancy. And that's necessary because the body has to meet the increased metabolic demands of the mother and the fetus, ensuring adequate uteroplacental circulation. And so the, the bottom line as to what the body has to do, we have to increase blood volume, increase cardiac output, and decrease systemic vascular resistance. And it's these changes that are going to allow the placenta to be adequately, um, have adequate circulation to support a fetus. So again, these are sort of the three things to remember. The blood volume increases, cardiac output increases, and the systemic vascular resistance, meaning the sort of overall body's resistance to blood flow decreases. The blood volume increases uh, really an amazing amount, 30 to 50% peaking at 34 weeks, and it starts quite early in pregnancy. The cardiac output, which is the amount of blood that flows through the body every minute, increases from a usual about five liters per minute up to 8.7 liters per minute by the third trimester. And we increase the blood volume um, that in part it causes an increased stroke volume. That's how much the heart pumps with every beat. And there's also an increased heart rate. So cardiac output is a combination of heart rate and stroke volume. So we, the body increases both of those to give this adequate cardiac output for pregnancy. And then our resistance, our vascular resistance through, through the, the body decreases. By week eight, it falls 10 to 30%. And then there's overall a fall of 40% um, and it naders by week 32. Part of this decrease in the systemic vascular resistance, it leads the body um, to stimulate catecholamines, which is like our sympathetic nervous system, and an increase in sympathetic tone. And that increases in, uh, in part, or in, it leads to an increase in heart rate and contractility. So when our nervous system is stimulated, when we have more catecholamines, our heart rate's faster and our heart contractility, meaning how sort of uh, strongly the heart's um, pumping or contracting those increase as well. So it's a combination of all these things um, that the body undergoes during pregnancy. The heart changes as well. So it's not only these parameters, but the left atrial size. So the heart has, I know there's a lot of people of different um, backgrounds, I think on this talk. So the heart has four chambers, two top chambers, two bottom chambers. The left atrium, the top chamber on the left increases in size. The left ventricle increases in size. The left ventricle increases in wall thickness and um, both the left and right increase ventricular mass. The ejection fraction, meaning how well the heart pumps, remains stable. So that should not decrease with pregnancy or change with pregnancy. And PCWP, that stands for pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. So that's the pressures in the lung. That does not increase. So we have this increase in all these parameters. We have the heart getting bigger, wall thickness increasing, but it doesn't affect the ability of the heart to do what it needs to do. So our squeeze function remains the same and our ability to pump blood forward remains the same. Uh, at delivery, the cardiac output increases even further. Um, part of that is sort of the stress of labor, but also the as the blood transfuses back to the systemic circulation with contraction. So that's a large amount of this blood volume that's been so, you know, sort of sent towards the fetus that now goes back into the mother's systemic circulation. Heart rate increases. And then after delivery, there's an immediate, um, we start diuresing. So we, we start sort of peeing off some of the extra blood volume. There's a fall in, fall in the stroke volume and the heart rate more gradually decreases. Um, this, it's a little blurry, this slide, but this sort of goes over all the changes. So the hemodynamics, we talked about the increase in cardiac output, decrease in systemic vascular resistance, the heart rate increases, blood pressure generally falls a little bit and then plateaus. Our sympathetic nervous system's higher. We have increased uh, estrogen and progesterone um, produced by the body. Our renin-angiotensin system is increased. Uh, respiratory changes, these, the changes to our hematologic um, state, uh, glucose and lipids. But really, these top, uh, top two are really, I think, most um, relevant to our talk. 
Cardiac output is the blue line that increases, heart rate increases, that's the gray line. Blood pressure is about stable, and then that resistance decreasing. And then we see that everything sort of normalizes in the early postpartum stage. And just another, another way to look at it. So these are a ton of changes that happen. Um, and uh, that's um, you know, some of the beauties of pregnancy. But we'll get into the pathologic things that can happen. Um, and understanding the physiologic changes help us understand why these things could happen. OK, so acute um, MI in pregnancy. And I'll start with the case presentation. And both case presentations are uh, people that I have been involved in their care or have uh, met them in some uh, medical circumstance. This is a 41-year-old woman with a history of endometriosis and PCOS. She had been pregnant three times. She had uh, um, had three spontaneous abortions. Her husband had two children from prior relationships. And so she underwent IVF. One embryo was implanted. She ended up being pregnant with twins. That was thought either to be that embryo that split, or she might have had an egg that, um, that had been fertilized. Her twins were delivered by a C-section because of placenta previa, and I don't actually know, I don't recall what week she was when she delivered. She came to an outside hospital five days later with chest pain radiating to her back, into her left shoulder, and her arm, and she had shortness of breath. This is her presenting EKG, and I know um, that probably all of you guys don't look at EKGs daily, but I'll point out the relevant factors here. So she had and these leads V1 and V2, which sort of project over the um, anterior wall of the heart, so the frontmost part of the, wall of the heart, those are elevated. So we call that ST elevation. And then she had in these other leads, you can see these depressions. So the ST segment is sort of depressed compared to the baseline. So she has ST elevations in anterior leads, those are the anterior portion of the heart. And we call these reciprocal changes where we have depression elsewhere. So postpartum, five days, um, chest pressure and shortness of breath and a ST elevation on EKG. So that's very concerning for an acute MI. She's brought to the cath lab and this is um, a picture. So it, what we do in a heart catheterization um, is access the coronary arteries through either the wrist or the groin uh, through the artery. And we send this, and again, I wish my mouse worked, but it really, uh, here we go see it trying to make its way. So this wire up here, this is a wire coming up the body and it loops around and into the aortic root and a little bit of dye is shot through into the coronary artery system and we see if the flow is normal or if there's blockages. So what we see here is this, this tapers off. So this um, artery is supposed to be big and plump just like the one that's sort of going down the screen. And then we see some narrowing in this artery here, that's the LAD. So we have the left main, we have two main um, arteries in the heart. We have the left main and the right coronary artery. The left circumflex you can see is a nice big plump vessel where that LAD really tapers into um, really nothing. So this is what was identified. She had some disease in her left main and she had an LAD occlusion. So that's our case presentation. And unfortunately, it's not all too uncommon. So pregnancy-associated MI is myocardial infarction during pregnancy or the postpartum period. Accounts for over 20% of maternal cardiac deaths. Um, the rates are 2.8 to 8.1 per 100,000 deliveries. That's fourfold higher than among non-pregnant reproductive age women. And we're seeing an increase in incidence. Older mothers, perhaps an increased awareness and more comorbidities quite a high mortality, 5% associated mortality, and it's higher for the fetus. And um, so the, it's more common in pregnancy, and then also the repercussions are worse. So there's a higher mortality in pregnancy-associated MI versus non-pregnancy-associated MI. The peak incidence is in the third trimester in the postpartum period. Maternal risk factors include Smoking is one of, if you look in different series, they will list different things that are associated, but smoking, hyperlipidemia, and hypertension are all sort of across the board associated. Diabetes, thrombophilia, age over 35, anemia are all maternal risk factors, and then pregnancy-related risk factors. So again, the, the hemodynamic changes we'll talk about a little bit in a minute, um, and the hormonal changes, how that affect um, our risk for acute MI.
but um, multi-parity postpartum infection and postpartum hemorrhage are also risk factors associated with the pregnancy. So how can an acute MI present? Um, you have the, the main things that somebody will present with are chest pain and shortness of breath. They also might um, uh, um, say they have palpitations, but those things are pretty nonspecific. We can see all these overlapping uh, circles that really have a lot of reasons for why somebody might have these symptoms. Um, they can also present with the, the things that would really be sort of make you want to have a high level of suspicion for um, MI besides the just sort of generic chest pain and shortness of breath. Obviously, if they're presenting in cardiac arrest or with ventricular arrhythmias, if their EKG shows ischemic changes, if their cardio biomarkers are elevated, so CK, CK can be an troponin. Now these can all be elevated after delivery. There's a new, um, we look now at high sensitivity troponin, which is different from the old troponin test. So the older troponin probably wouldn't be elevated after delivery, but this new high sensitivity one that might be elevated after delivery. But if they're significantly elevated or trending upwards, severe JVD or jugular venous distension, which would be a sign of heart failure, and a murmur of mitral regurgitation, which could be um, uh, ischemia related mitral regurgitation, crackles on a lung exam, and then if the echo shows wall motion abnormality. So all of these are features that should give you obviously a higher index of suspicion. There's other things that can be really bad that can present with these symptoms. So valvular heart disease, uh, somebody who's diagnosed with their mitral stenosis with pregnancy, PE, aortic dissection, and there are uh, patients that are more at risk for aortic dissection with pregnancy, and then postpartum or peripartum cardiomyopathy. So a lot of things to keep in mind uh, for the pregnant woman or postpartum who presents with symptoms like this. But in our case, you know, chest pain, shortness of breath, she had the ischemic changes on EKG, and then her cardiac biomarkers were elevated as well. When we think about acute MI in a non-pregnant population, what we think of most commonly is atherosclerotic heart disease. So that's when we develop, uh, you have cardi traditional cardiac risk factors, you have um, uh, lipoproteins that are circulating in the blood system. You have plaque formation in coronary arteries. And then the quote unquote vulnerable plaque is one that has this thin cap over this um, highly thrombogenic lipid rich core. So you have this thin plaque that for some reason that you know we don't fully understand ruptures, you get this big platelet rich thrombus that forms in the coronary artery and that leads to an acute MI. So that's the um, sort of pathophysiology behind atherosclerotic heart disease. That's not exactly what we see with um, pregnancy related MI, although that can happen. So atherosclerosis is attributed to about a third of the cases, but what's more common uh, in pregnancy versus in any other state is spontaneous coronary artery dissection. So that's about a to anywhere from 25 to 40 percent of cases of pregnancy associated MI. And in non pregnant populations, it's a cause of 0.28 to 1.1 percent of cases. So, such a huge risk of sort of time in, in a population's life to have this risk of, of SCAD, as we call it. You can have embolic events or in situ thrombosis. Pregnancy is a hypercoagulable state. So, you could have um, a clot that forms somewhere and travels to the coronary artery. Coronary vasospasm is where you have spasm in a coronary artery. It might look normal at most times, but you have this sort of uh, spontaneous spasm of the artery that can cause ventricular arrhythmias and symptoms of heart attack or you know, can cause um, heart attack, elevation in, in troponin, et cetera. And during pregnancy, we have this increased vascular reactivity that we talked about, this increased um, sympathetic tone, et cetera. And so vasospasm can happen more commonly in pregnancy. And then microvascular dysfunction, <clears throat> which is um, sort of the, the small capillaries that feed the heart, uh, you can have uh, dysfunction there. And that is generally doesn't present as this sort of dramatic acute myocardial infarction, but you can have non-ST elevation MI related to that. Uh, this is a review of 150 patients with pregnancy-associated MI that was either published or presented in other forums like case presentations. The mean age was 34. The majority were over the age of 30, and then a small, uh, almost a half were over the age of 35. The vast majority, 
69% per, presented with acute with anterior MI. So when people talk about the widow maker, that's that LAD, that, that artery that um, supplies the anterior, the front wall of the heart. 47% um, were multiparous. Uh, we have obesity, preeclampsia, hypertension, smoking 25% and hyperlipidemia was 20%. 75% of these patients presented with this ST elevation MI, which is sort of a, a ST elevation versus non-ST elevation is generally when the, um, you, when the vessel is completely occluded and you have this injury across the whole wall thickness of a portion of the left ventricle. And end STEMI is generally not completely occlusive or uh, the full thickness of the ventricle is, has not been affected. So an S, a STEMI is a much more uh, dramatic and generally a worse presentation. 80% of these um, patients were in the third trimester or postpartum. And then this uh, is one of those patients, uh, one of the series showing that the coronary dissection, that spontaneous coronary artery dissection was 43%. Atherosclerosis was 27%. And then uh, these other causes were less common. 73% um, of uh, the SCAD patients presented postpartum and 21% in the third trimester. The LAD was affected in 39 patients. Um, and that left main, which is, you know, supplies all that, a lot of that portion of the left ventricle in 24. Um, only uh, 34 out of 56 had only single vessel involvement, which means that a lot of these patients are presenting with more than one coronary vessel involved. Versus SCAD, which presents again in mostly postpartum or third trimester, the atherosclerotic heart disease was evenly distributed among, among trimesters. So those are patients with coronary atherosclerosis, that more common presentation of acute MI. Um, of these patients, 59 underwent PCI, which is stenting, and 30 required bypass surgery. And there was a lot of complications, 38% with heart failure or cardiogenic shock, 12 with ventricular arrhythmias, uh, 19 with uh, recurrent angina. In this series, 7% maternal mortality and 5% fetal mortality. So general management strategies for acute MI in pregnancy. If patients have ST elevation MI, so sort of that full occlusion of the vessel or unstable and at we call a non-STEMI or N-STEMI, um, those patients we want to revascularize. So that means take to the cath lab and try and open the vessel. Now, the difficulty of this is that with SCAD in particular, it is not the easiest thing to stent. There's an increased risk of complications and limited technical success. We'll get into that in a second. Thrombolytics, which is one way of treating STEMIs with when people don't have easy access to the cath lab, that should generally be avoided due to risk of maternal and fetal hemorrhage or worsening of the dissection if it's this SCAD. And drug safety data is limited. Non-OB providers, uh, you know, get scared treating pregnant women because we just don't have data on a lot of drugs. Um, ACE inhibitors and statins are contraindicated. Plavix or clopidogrel is generally reserved for stenting. Beta blockers are usually advised. Aspirin's considered safe. Um, Heparin may be used, but might not be appropriate if SCAD is diagnosed and diuretics are considered safe. And so this is um, an algorithm to think about treating MI in pregnancy. For ST elevation MI, you would take it, it's a class one indication to take to the cath lab and do a coronary angiography, which is that heart catheterization and PCI if indicated. If it's a high risk um, non-ST elevation MI, you would do the same, but if it's low risk, you might be able to manage it medically. We worry about radiation exposure to the fetus, uh, which is why anybody would be concerned about taking a pregnant woman to the cath lab. But it, there is data that the um, dosing to the fetus could be less than one milligray. And 50 milligrays is the dosing at which um, for, for early in pregnancy, zero to two, or that wouldn't, I guess, even be pregnant, um, death or nothing two to eight weeks during the period of organogenesis, 200 to 250 is sort of the dosing that would lead to congenital anomalies. And then um, we, you can see in this sort of graph down here um, when it, what dosing is considered to be dangerous or not. But if 50 is the sort of lower uh, limit for potentially causing harm, if we can do a, a, a heart cath and stent less than one milligray exposure to the fetus, then that should be safe for the fetus. Labor and delivery, de, uh, delivery should wait two to three weeks after in, intervention. If bypass is indicated, um, 
the doc, the team may consider an early C-section if the pregnancy is advanced enough. In general, vaginal delivery would be preferred with early pain control. And future pregnancy would really be considered high risk and a uh, woman might be counseled against future pregnancy. I wanna get a little bit more um, in, depth on, in depth onto SCAD. Well, again, because it's uncommon in a non-pregnant population, um, fibromuscular dysplasia is one of the um, patient populations that we see SCAD in, in a non-pregnant situation. And, um, you know, it really is, um, again, sort of more unique to the population. So SCAD is not when you have this atherosclerotic plaque, but where you have separation within the arterial wall by an intramural hematoma. This can e either be spontaneous or you can have some injury to the wall, the vessel wall that can lead to dissection within the vessel. And so um, here, this top image on the right, this is where you have this uh, spontaneous formation of um, a thrombus or hemorrhage within the wall of the vessel. And then this one down here in the center, it was a, an injury to the vessel itself that led to this um, interruption there. So that's what SCAD looks like. And so what about pregnancy can be predisposing? The increased estrogen and progesterone levels lead to a decrease in collagen synthesis, an increase in media mucopolysaccharide content, inflammatory changes, release of proteolytic enzymes, degradation of collagen matrix. So all of this leads to a lack of structural support of the vessel and a weakening of the vessel wall. So the hormonal changes cause changes in the vessel wall that can be predisposing. Along with that, you have this increase in cardiac output with pregnancy and labor and delivery. So there's some, a, a term called shear stress, and that's the, as, as blood flows forward through a vessel, there's frictional force that's generated on the wall of the vessel. And so that increase on shear stress on the coronary arteries can lead to an already perhaps weakened coronary artery wall to lead to spontaneous dissection. Uh, for pregnancy SCAD, the mean presenting age is 33. Patients present with same as acute MI, chest pain, dyspnea, heart failure, symptoms, ventricular arrhythmias, and shock. And the gold standard is coronary angiography. But with that, there's a risk of propagating the dissection. So if you're putting a wire and a catheter into the coronary artery to shoot, even though you're trying to look really at just at the um, takeoff of the vessel, but if you engage the dissection flap, you can propagate the dissection. Um, it presents as a long diffuse stenosis, and I will show another repeat image of that, the patient's heart catheterization. Atherosclerotic plaques are usually absent. This is a completely separate pathophysiology, and it tends to include these proximal coronary vessels, the left main and LAD, it tends to have multivessel dissections and worse ejection fraction. A lot of dissections will heal on their own, um, which is good because stenting can be technically challenging. You have to wire the coronary artery to stent it. And so if you're wiring and there's dissection there, you might not be in the right, the correct, the true lumen. And um, dissection extension is a real risk. Bypass is reserved for left main dissection or when you cannot, either you can't do PCI, which is again, percutaneous coronary intervention is stenting when it's not feasible or it fails. And that also can be technically challenging. Um, Sometimes these vessels, again, they'll spontaneously heal. And so if you've bypassed or put a bypass graft to a vessel that heals on its own, that graft ends up failing because the blood flow will preferentially go through the native vessel. And sometimes these patients need mechanical support like balloon pumps or even ECMO. For SCAD, you can try medical therapy unless you have ongoing chest pain, um, cardiogenic shocks, sustained ventricular arrhythmias, VT or VF, or left main dissection. And so if any of these higher risk features are present, then you would need to, um, to go forward with PCI. So in our patient's uh, case, she had um, the left main didn't seem to be dissected, but that LAD was dissected and uh, she had a, um, a STEMI. And so these are the things that led for her to have intervention. So this was um, after they wired her coronary artery, they stented it open and this was the final result and I'll, show the old image. So this vessel here that had been dissected and we see how it sort of tapers off to nothing is now open. And you see all these vessels, blood vessels here that we didn't see in the other one. So we, it was a large area of the heart muscle that wasn't receiving any blood flow that was then opened up after they stented um, her LAD. 
She was started on dual antiplatelet antiplatelet with uh, Plavix and aspirin. And now again, she was uh, had she was postpartum, so um, there was you know not as high concern about starting her on these meds. Statin beta blocker and an ARB. Her ejection fraction was 30 to 35 percent. She was discharged on a life vest. She's currently NYHA class, really two to three. Uh, the higher the class, the worse the impairment. So she's doing pretty well. She exercises and is active. She doesn't have any significant um, limitation. Her ejection fraction has improved to 40 to 45 percent. But on her M cardiac MRI, she has a lot of scarring in her LAD distribution, so that anterior wall of the heart. So unfortunately, she remains at risk for future cardiac arrhythmias, um, which is the reason that I met her was to sort of evaluate her risk. So she's doing really well. Um, uh, but, you know, definitely a, a, a scary case. Okay, we are going to um, shift gears to arrhythmia. And again, since I can't see anybody, if anyone has any questions, just holler out. Uh, otherwise, I'll move on. Okay. Um, okay, so starting off with a case presentation for arrhythmia and pregnancy. So uh, this is another woman that I met that I might have um, been messaging with Dr. Krishna about. The, a 28-year-old woman, it was her first pregnancy. Her baseline heart rate before pregnancy was 80. She got an Apple Watch during her pregnancy and she found that her heart rate was always above 100 and usually 120 to 130. So that's why she got referred to cardiology who then referred to me. This was her presenting EKG when I met her. Um, we can see here that her heart rate is fast. So her heart rate here is about 130 to 140. And her, you could say, well, maybe she's just pregnant and you told me already people have a higher heart rate in pregnancy, but this is, you know, this is fairly elevated. That's maybe an increase of 10 to 15 beats per minute above somebody's baseline. But this woman's sitting here at 130 pretty much all the time. We can tell that it's likely not sinus tachycardia because her P waves, which would be here, here, and here, uh, this is where we look at to try and tell if it's coming from the sinus node or not. Her P waves don't look normal. So we this would be called an atrial tachycardia, a fast rate coming from some abnormal focus in her atrium. I put on a monitor on her, and this is what she did. So this um, during the period of monitoring, her heart rate was either sitting at sort of 110 to 120, or for a really the majority of the time was sitting between 120 and 140, so quite high. So for her atrial tachycardia, um, given concerns about how, how fast she was going, we put her on a beta blocker. I contacted her OB. She got set up with MFM. And her resting heart rate reduced to, a to 80 to 100. Um, as a non-MFM and non-OB, I was you know, concerned about having her on a beta blocker. We um, during the course of the pregnancy, got echocardiograms that showed no, normal ejection fraction, and I cautioned her about the risk of, um, of uh, fetal growth restriction or intrauterine growth restriction. So we, we had conversations about that, that every time I saw her. So arrhythmias in pregnancy are very common, um, and this is arrhythmias of all kinds, and so we'll get into a little bit of the specifics. This can be a continuation of known arrhythmia or a new manifestation. And similarly to um, MI in pregnancy, it's hemodynamic, hormonal, and autonomic changes of pregnancy that all contribute. So I talked about the left ventricle being a little bit bigger, the left atrium being a little bit bigger. So this increased blood volume puts stretch on the atrium and ventricle. And anytime the atrium or ventricle is stretched, that can cause irritability. The increased heart rate on its own from this increased sympathetic tone can be arrhythmogenic. Um, estradiol and progesterone have pro-arrhythmic um, uh, contributions. Our adrenergic responsiveness is increased in pregnancy. And then estrogen also seems to increase the number of adrenergic receptors in the myocardium, which might also contribute to arrhythmia. Um, general management themes for arrhythmia in pregnancy. So number one, exclude contributing medical conditions. Rule out hyperthyroidism, rule out PE. When there are significant symptoms or risk to the mother or fetus, that's when we would recommend treating. It is nice to try and prevent curative, to try and prevent arrhythmias from happening by curative management prior to pregnancy. So a patient who has um, 
uh, AVNRT or WPW that already they're having episodes pre-pregnancy, but they've not been bad enough to get treated, well, it might be a good idea to try and treat that before they get pregnant to avoid having to worry about it during pregnancy. Most drugs are category C, but many are safely used, and we'll go over that, go into the drugs a little bit in a second. Cardioversion does not appear to compromise blood flow to the fetus and is unlikely to induce fetal arrhythmia, so it is recommended that the fetal, uh, that there is fetal monitoring at time of cardioversion. And adenosine, which can acutely terminate SVP, SVT, appears safe to use. Ablation is an option during pregnancy with low radiation exposure to the fetus. So if there are symptoms, they should be treated. Uh, medications are first line. Um, acutely cardioversion can be used, but ablation is an option that's out there. A lot of um, antiarrhythmic drugs that we use, and um, it's interesting, like quinidine, which is rare, we rarely use now, has a lot of long-term data because that's one of the older antiarrhythmics. But the ones that I'll um, point out, um, the uh, amiodarone, uh, has been associated with uh, fetal hypothyroidism, uh, prematurity, um, and some other issues with pregnancy. So amiodarone is considered class D. And while most beta blockers are thought safe to use, atenolol still gets a class D um, risk category associated with low birth weight. And dronetarone, which is an antiarrhythmic, um, it's sort of similar to amiodarone. It's used for atrial fibrillation. That is a class X for vascular and limb abnormalities and cleft palate. Um, but the, a lot of the other antiarrhythmics, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, flecainide, sodalol, these can be used during pregnancy. So getting it a little bit more into the specifics of arrhythmia. Uh, PACs and PVCs, so those are extra beats from the top or bottom chambers, those are very common and generally don't require treatment. So well, if somebody even is inclined to having, you know, sort of brief palpitations when you're in, in that pregnant state and uh, this increased cardiac output, increased heart rate, et cetera, the stretch on the chambers that can lead to an increase in PACs and PVCs. SVT is the most common sustained arrhythmia during pregnancy. SVT has um, an incidence of 24 per 100,000 hospital admissions. Uh, a good minority of patients with pre existing SVT will experience exacerbation. And these are arrhythmias, again, uh, that I mentioned before ABNRT or, or um, ABRT. And I'm happy to go into specific, specifics of what those are if somebody is interested. But these are generally not life threatening arrhythmias. They don't have a stroke risk associated with them, but they can certainly be symptomatic. And the heart rate, especially in young people, can go pretty fast. Medical treatment for SVT is, includes sort of first line is beta blockers or verapamil. If it is refractory to those medications, you can use flecainide, quinidine for AVRT, digoxin can be used for AVNRT. And then um, WPW uh, can present with atrial fibrillation, which is a, is a dangerous, it is a one form of SVT that can lead to um, ventricular fibrillation. So acutely that can be treated with procainamide. So we do have some options for treating uh, SVT in pregnancy. And this graph on the bottom right um, just shows the distribution, ABNRT being the most common and um, AT and ABRTs being less common. This is a general population, but holds for pregnancy as well. The rhythms that are sort of have more consequence, atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter can have stroke risk associated due to thrombus formation in the left atrium. So fortunately, these are uncommon during pregnancy. A much lower incidence, two per 100,000. 50% of those with pre-existing atrial fibrillation will have symptomatic episodes. And sodalol or flecainide are the preferred antiarrhythmics for long-term suppression. AFib or flutter is usually seen now that we have more older pregnant women. So it's still an uncommon rhythm for younger people. Um, but if they happen to be unlucky enough to develop AFib at a younger age, they might see it during pregnancy or patients with uh, congenital heart disease um, might be more susceptible to these arrhythmias. And ventricular fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia are also fortunately uncommon, um, also a low incidence, usually in the setting of structural heart disease. There are some normal hearts that can get VT. This, these are called um, RVOT VT or fascicular VT, and these aren't considered to be as um, malignant as other forms of ventricular tachycardia. And we also have some drug options for ventricular arrhythmia, sodalol, lidocaine, mixolatine, and procainamide. 
Specific populations that predispose to ventricular arrhythmias are long QT syndrome, specifically in the postpartum period. And those patients should be maintained on beta blocker throughout pregnancy and certainly um, in the postpartum period. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, ARVC, arrhythmogenic right ventricular um, cardiomyopathy, congenital heart disease, so congenital, you know, any of, any of the um, uh, congenital heart disease, ASD, VSD, valve abnormalities, and then CPVT, which stands for catecholaminergic polymorphic VT, which is a ventricular arrhythmia that comes about with exercise. So these are channelopathies or uh, inherited um, cardiomyopathies that can predispose to ventricular arrhythmia during pregnancy. Um, devices during pregnancy. So bradyarrhythmias, so slow rates, are uncommon during pregnancy. So it's not common for a young woman to develop slow heart rates. And sometimes people, there's something called congenital AV block where you're born with a lack of communication in the electrical system between the top and bottom chambers. And that can be identified at pregnancy. That doesn't generally need a pacemaker at that time. And so fortunately, these are uncommon during pregnancy. There's not a lot of pregnant women out there with ICDs because there's not a whole lot of a population of young women who need ICDs, but there are some. Um, this was one literature, literature review I found that showed 133 pregnant women with an ICD. And this does not seem to, they do not seem to be at increased risk of ICD therapies during pregnancy or delivery. So fortunately, um, uh, you know, at least on this cohort that has known ventricular arrhythmia seem to do okay with pregnancy. I'm currently following um, a young woman who had cardiac arrest at a young age and um, she has an ICD and so I'm following with her, she's been doing well. I think this graph is pretty um, pretty cool. So the devices can show what's called this Optival fluid index. And it's supposed to measure if people are putting on more fluid. And so it's helpful to look at with patients with heart failure. Well, this is about when she got pregnant and you see this really sharp increase in her fluid index. It doesn't mean that she was in heart failure. She just got pregnant and had that increase in cardiac output. So I thought that was really neat to see sort of, I probably could have told her she was pregnant. Uh, before she told me. But um, so that's just a re real time application of what, what we've been talking about. So, ablation for arrhythmia in pregnancy. Um, why would we do this? It would be for somebody who has refractory SVT. Um, there is uh, WPW, which is um, related to these fast arrhythmias and can be associated with a this atrial fibrillation that can uh, degenerate to ventricular fibrillation. That might be somebody that you need to ablate in pregnancy. So um, it should be, you should, one should be able to do ablation with a, a low amount of radiation exposure to the fetus. Again, a 50 milligrays is our sort of lower limit for being concerned about fetal anomalies or pregnancy loss. One study, now this was not Lot, uh, this was not on pregnant women, but it was sort of a theoretical fetal radiation, and they found it to be less than one milligray. So it should be possible to do it safely. We have now um, the the risk is that you're using you're using fluoroscopy or live X-ray while you're doing these procedures to help find where you are. Well, nowadays we have these electroanatomic mapping systems where you're not having to use live X-ray. You can get your wires in place. You can see where you're going. You can see everything by just using wires that you get from the groin up to the heart. So this is not a pregnant woman. And this was um, a PVC case that we did, but this is just showing, this is a map that's made of the heart. And this is the, uh, the aorta here. This is the right sides of the heart. This is the left ventricle. And so we're doing everything with very minimal radiation exposure. Um, we also use intracardiac echocardiogram that helps us identify where we are. So this is a, and not from one of my cases, but this is something we do almost daily where we're crossing from the right atrium to the left atrium. And you can see exactly what you're doing on intracardiac echocardiogram, not having to use fluoroscopy. So again, there are ways that we can really minimize our radiation exposure. Um, these are, this is a busy chart, but I think it's helpful for sort of thinking about what are low risk, medium risk, and high risk arrhythmia patients. So low risk would be SVT, AFib, um, idiopathic VT, meaning VT without structural heart disease, low risk um, long QT syndrome and WPW. These are sort of patients that you still do need to have a cardiology consulted, um, but you sort of worry about them a little bit less. Medium risk would be unstable SVT or VT, those with an ICD, structural heart disease, 
And those would be ones that you might want to monitor cardiac rhythm, have an IV line available, be ready to treat if needed. And then high risk would be unstable VT and structural heart disease, unstable VT or VF. Um, those would be our higher risk. So sort of just thinking about what woman needs or what pregnant uh, person needs what level of support. Okay, so for our patient um, at 30, so everything was doing fine at 36 weeks, the fetus was diagnosed with fetal growth restriction, which certainly um, got me panicking a little bit. I communicated with her MFM and decreased the metoprolol in half. We still get kept her heart rate controlled, but you know, the team was like, well, we don't really want her heart rate being so fast. So you know, we reduced it, but then kept an eye on the heart rate. She had a C-section at 37 weeks. The baby was breached and was born at five pounds, five ounces. Um, baby's doing great now. The patient had an Im almost immediate drop in her heart rate. So I, this was her heart, her EKG a week prior to delivery. So still this sort of ectopic atrial rhythm. Um, this is not as fast. This is about a heart rate of 100. And then she told me that it was almost immediate. By the time I got her back in, she was two weeks post-delivery. She's got a totally normal EKG. Her, her P wave looks normal, her heart rate's normal. So in her case, it was really just the stress of pregnancy that drove her arrhythmia. Um, and here I'm just showing the P waves, how different they looked the before and after. So for her, I um, counseled her that, you know, if you're thinking of getting it pregnant again, which she is, we might should try and identify this and get rid of it before your pregnancy. And so we brought her to the EP lab, but I was not able to induce anything. I, you know, it's nearly impossible to mimic, or not nearly, it's impossible to mimic the physiologic changes of pregnancy in a non-pregnant woman. So I didn't get anything going. I hope that another pregnancy is not gonna cause the same thing. Um, but you know, I think in the end, she seemed to do okay. All right, so my take home points, um, cardiovascular disease is one of the leading causes of maternal mortality in the US. Acute MI is more common in pregnancy than in a similar non-pregnant population. Arrhythmia in pregnancy is common. SVT and atrial arrhythmias are more common than ventricular arrhythmias. A multidisciplinary approach should be taken to managing these patients and invasive procedures can be used, utilized for cases that pose a high risk to mother and fetus. And um, these are, if I didn't have them in the slides, these are my works cited. Um, okay, that's what I got. And I know we have some, some questions that I did, but I'm happy to take questions that you guys might have. Uh, thank you, Dr. Westerman. That was an excellent and very thorough discussion. Um, I really learned a lot. Um, I have a question. You didn't go too much into this, but I have a question about um, medications for like long QT syndrome. Um, you know, you try to avoid those medications that would prolong the QT. And so um, going through this, and I, I just recently had a patient who has long QT and is pregnant. We might, it might be a mutual patient that we're having. Um, and going through like the most commonly used obstetric drugs, one of them that could moderately prolong is uh, Pitocin. Um, and so that is something that we do commonly use in pregnancy. Um, one, if we're inducing someone um, or if someone comes in in natural labor, then you're doing it um, prophylactically sort of for, to prevent postpartum hemorrhage. And so... Um, you know, I try to look up information on whether like, you know, was it a dose of it, you know, prolong, like how long you're on Pitocin, because some of these inductions can take, you know, up to like 48 hours. So just wondering if you had any insight um, to that. No, I, I, I don't. And I, um, I wish that I had looked that up to be able to talk to you about it a little bit um, um, more coherently. But I, I would have to look up Pitocin and, um, and see what its effects are. There are different long QT syndromes. There's the biggest ones are one, two, and three, and those have different um, uh, channelopathies that lead to it. So it might be that there would be one that we might worry about more or less. Um, if, they're, if they're on beta blocker and their QT interval is stable, it might be something that would be safe to use with careful monitoring. And you'd also think about their history of arrhythmia. Uh, so one, one long QT is not another long QT. Um, that it's really for some, especially long QT syndrome too, that postpartum seems to be a really increased risk of ventricular arrhythmia. So perhaps in that delivery period, it would be okay. Um, but that's why, you know, these patients really need really multidisciplinary following. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Westerman. Um, so please, anybody who has questions, you can go ahead and put those in the chat. Um, and I do have up your question and answer section so we can kind of go through that while people are thinking about their questions. Um, and you just let me know if you wanted to walk us through that. Sure. Um, so physiologic changes of pregnancy. Um, normal physiology of pregnancy includes a systemic vascular resistance increases, heart rate increases, cardiac output increases, B blood volume increases, cardiac output increases, or systemic vascular resistance decreases. Uh, C lots of words on these. I'm sorry. C left ventricular size increases, left atrial size increases, left ventricular ejection fraction decreases, or D sympathetic tone decreases, cardiac output increases. Maybe just in the interest of time, we can go to the answer. I don't know. So the right answer is B. So the blood volume increases, cardiac output increases, and systemic vascular resistance decreases. And then I have in red why the other ones were, um, you know, where, where they were wrong. So I, I fixed them. So A was wrong because it says cardio systemic vascular resistance increases, but B is the right answer. What is the most common time of presentation of pregnancy-related acute MI? First trimester, second trimester, or third trimester and postpartum period? And the answer to that is third trimester and postpartum period. Um, yeah. Which two antiarrhythmic drugs are considered class D or X in pregnancy? Metoprolol and flecainide, quinidine and procainamide, um, sotalol, mixilatine, or amiodarone and dronetarone. Hopefully these all came through in the lecture, but amio and dronetarone uh, for those reasons. And um, and all the other ones are usable for uh, atrial and ventricular arrhythmias. And question four, invasive cardiac procedures are absolutely contraindicated in pregnancy due to fetal risk. And the answer to that is false. So fetal radiation exposure can theoretically be done at a very low um, radiation exposure. Well, thank you again, Dr. Westman. And please, anybody who has any questions, we have a comment here that this was really informative. Definitely appreciated the arrhythmia medication list. Um, just truly fascinating um, and appreciate the breaking down the reality of um, the complications that physio uh, pregnancy physiology can have um, that can lead to these M uh, acute MIs and arrhythmias. Um, also, really grateful that you highlighted the multidisciplinary care team and the importance of that. That is a um, first uh, readiness um, intervention that is part of the uh, AIM Cardiac Conditions and OB Care Bundle. Um, you talked a lot about response interventions, um, and I think I mentioned it earlier, those facility-specific escalation policies and those checklists. Um, and then also the patient education as part of the bundle, it's the patient education on subsequent pregnancies and the risks thereafter. So you really did touch upon a lot of um, the key bundle interventions. So um, really appreciate uh, you, Dr. Westerman and um, Dr. Krishna for putting this all together. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. Does anybody have any final questions or any comments? And what, one thing I'll add, I didn't put my name or my email there at all, but. If there's any questions you guys have, then um, please feel free to email me. And uh, I might not be the right person, but hopefully I can put you in touch with um, whoever is. Um, because really, I mean, like I started at the beginning, such an important job you guys have to keep pregnant women healthy in, during their pregnancy and afterwards. And so um, I, I'm happy to help in any way I can. Thank you so much. And thanks to everybody who's joined today. And again, Happy New Year to everybody. And um, this will be up on the website shortly, as well as on Microsoft Teams, the presentation and recording. So have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thanks again. Thank you.